Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapter Twelve I Hear of the Red Fox. Before we had done cleaning out the roundhouse, a breeze sprang up from a little to the east of north. This blew off the rain and brought out the sun. And here I must explain, and the reader would do well to look at a map. On the day when the fog fell and we ran down Allen's boat, we had been running through the little minch. At dawn after the battle, we lay becalmed to the east of the Isle of Canna, or between that and Isle Eriska in the chain of the Long Island. Now to get from there to the Linny Lock, the straight course was through the narrows of the Sound of Mull. But the captain had no chart. He was afraid to trust his brig so deep among the islands, and the wind serving well, he preferred to go by west of Tyree and come up under the southern coast of the great Isle of Mull. All day the breeze held in the same point, and rather freshened than died down, and towards afternoon a swell began to set in from round the outer Hebrides. Our course, to go round about the inner isles, was to the west of south, so that at first we had the swell upon our beam, and were much rolled about. But after nightfall, when we had turned the end of Tyree and began to head more to the east, the sea came right astern. Meanwhile, the early part of the day, before the swell came up, was very pleasant, sailing as we were in a bright sunshine and with many mountainous islands upon different sides. Alan and I sat in the roundhouse with the doors open on each side, the wind being straight astern and smoked a pipe or two of the captain's fine tobacco. It was at this time we heard each other's stories, which was the more important to me, as I gained some knowledge of that wild highland country on which I was so soon to land. In those days, so close on the back of the great rebellion, it was needful a man should know what he was doing when he went upon the heather. It was I that showed the example telling him all my misfortune, which he heard with great good nature. Only when I came to mention that good friend of mine, Mr. Campbell, the minister, Alan fired up and cried out that he hated all that were of that name. Why, said I, he is a man you should be proud to give your hand to. I know nothing I would help a Campbell to, says he, unless it was a leaden bullet. I would hunt all of that name like black cocks. If I lay dying, I would crawl upon my knees to my chamber window for a shot at one. Why, Alan, I cried, what ails ye at the Campbells? Well, says he, ye ken very well that I am an Appen Stuart, and the Campbells have long harried and wasted those of my name. Ay, and got lands of us by treachery, but never with the sword he cried loudly, and with the word brought down his fist upon the table. But I paid the less attention to this, for I knew it was usually said by those who have the underhand. "'There's more than that,' he continued, "'and all in the same story. Lying words, lying papers, tricks fit for a peddler, and the show of what's legal over all, to make a man the more angry.' "'You are so wasteful of your buttons,' said I. "'I can hardly think you would be a good judge of business.' "'Ha! Ah, says he, falling again to smiling. "'I got my wastefulness from the same men I got the buttons from, "'and that was my poor father, Duncan Stewart. "'Grace be to him. "'He was the prettiest man of his kindred, "'and the best swordsman in the Highlands, David, "'and that is the same as to say, in all the world I should ken, for it was him that taught me. He was in the black watch, when first it was mustered, and like other gentlemen privates had a gilly at his back to carry his firelock for him on the march. Well, the king, it appears, was wishful to see Highland swordsmanship, and my father and three more were chosen out and sent to London town, to let him see it at the best. So they were had into the palace, and showed the whole art of the sword for two hours at a stretch, 
before King George and Queen Carline, and the Butcher Cumberland, and many more of whom I have no mind. And when they were through, the King, for all he was a rank usurper, spoke them fair, and gave each man three guineas in his hand. Now, as they were going out of the palace, they had a porter's lodge to go by, and it came in on my father, as he was perhaps the first private Highland gentleman that had ever gone by that door. It was right he should give the poor porter a proper notion of their quality. So he gives the king's three guineas into the man's hand, as if it was his common custom. The three others that came behind him did the same, and there they were on the street, never a penny the better for their pains. Some say it was one that was the first to fee the king's porter, and some say it was another. But the truth of it is that it was Duncan Stuart, as I am willing to prove with either sword or pistol, and that was the father I had. God rest him. I think he was not the man to leave you rich, said I. And that's true, said Dallin. He left me my breeks to cover me, and little besides. And that was how I came to enlist, which was a black spot upon my character at the best of times, and would still be a sore job for me if I fell among the redcoats. What? cried I. Were you in the English army? That was I, said Alan. But I deserted to the right side at Preston Pans, and that's some comfort. I could scarcely share this view, holding desertion under arms for an unpardonable fault in honour. But for all I was so young, I was wiser than say my thought. "'Dear, dear,' says I, "'the punishment is death.' "'Aye,' said he, "'if they got the hands on me, it would be a short shrift and a long tow for Alan. But I have the King of France's commission in my pocket.' which would I be some protection? I misdoubt it much, said I. I have doubts myself, said Alan dryly. And good heaven, man, cried I, you that are a condemned rebel, and a deserter, and a man of the French kings, what tempts you back into this country? It's a braving of providence. Tut, says Alan. I have been back every year since forty-six. "'And what brings you, man?' cried I. "'Well, you see, I weary for my friends and country,' said he. "'France is a broad place, no doubt, but I weary for the heather and the deer. And then I have bit things that I attend to. Whilst I pick up a few lads to serve the King of France, recruits, you see, and that's I a little money.' But the heart of the matter is the business of my chief, Ardshiel. I thought they called your chief Appen, said I. Ay, but Ardshiel is the captain of the clan, said he, which scarcely cleared my mind. You see, David, he that was all his life so great a man, and come of the blood and bearing the name of kings, is now brought down to live in a French town like a poor and private person. He that had four hundred swords at his whistle, I have seen, with these eyes of mine, buying butter in the market-place, and taking it home in a kale-leaf. This is not only a pain, but a disgrace to us of his family and clan. There are the barns forby, the children and the hope of Appen, that must be learned their letters, and how to hold a sword in that far country. Now. The tenants of Appen have to pay a rent to King George, but their hearts are staunch, they are true to their chief, and what with love and a bit of pressure, and maybe a threat or two, the poor folks scrape up a second rent for Ardshiel. Well, David, I'm the hand that carries it. And he struck the belt about his body, so that the guineas rang. Do they pay both? cried I. "'Aye, David, both,' says he. "'What, two rents?' I repeated. "'Aye, David,' said he. "'I told a different tale to young Captain Man, but this is the truth of it, and it's wonderful to me how little pressure is needed. 
but that's the handiwork of my good kinsman and my father's friend, James of the Glens, James Stuart, that is, Ardshiel's half-brother. He it is that gets the money in, and does the management. This was the first time I heard the name of that James Stuart, who was afterwards so famous at the time of his hanging. But I took little heed at the moment, for all my mind was occupied with the generosity of these poor Highlanders. "'I call it noble!' I cried. "'I'm a Whig, or a little better, but I call it noble!' "'Aye,' said he, "'you're a Whig, but you're a gentleman, and that's what does it. Now, if you were one of the cursed race of Campbell, you would gnash your teeth to hear tell of it. If you were the Red Fox—' and at that name his teeth shut together, and he ceased speaking. I've seen many a grim face, but never a grimmer than Alan's when he had named the Red Fox. "'And who is the Red Fox?' I asked, daunted but still curious. "'Who is he?' cried Alan. "'Well, and I tell you that. When the men of the clans were broken at Culloden, and the good cause went down, and the horses rode over the fetlocks in the best blood of the north. Ardshiel had to flee like a poor deer upon the mountains, he and his lady and his bairns. A sad job we had of it before we got him shipped, and while he still lay in the heather, the English rogues, that couldn't come at his life, were striking at his rights. They stripped him of his powers, they stripped him of his lands, they plucked the weapons from the hands of his clansmen, that had borne arms for thirty centuries, ay, and the very clothes off their backs, so that it's now a sin to wear a tartan plaid, and a man may be cast into a jail if he has but a kilt about his legs. One thing they couldna kill, that was the love the clansmen bore their chief. These guineas are the proof of it, and now in there steps a man, a Campbell, red-headed Colin of Glenure. "'Is that him you call the Red Fox?' said I. "'Will you bring me his brush?' cried Alan fiercely. "'Aye, that's the man. In he steps, and gets papers from King George, to be so-called King's Factor on the lands of Appen. And at first he sings small, and his hail-fellow well met with Seamus. That's James of the Glens, my chieftain's agent. But by the by, that came to his ears that I have just told you, how the poor commons of Appen, the farmers and the crofters and the bowmen, were wringing their very plaids to get a second rent, and send it overseas for Ardshiel and his poor bairns. What was it you called it, when I told you? I called it noble, Alan, said I. I knew little better than a common wig, cries Alan. And when it came to Colin Roy, the black Campbell blood in him ran wild. He sat gnashing his teeth at the wine-table. What? Should a Stuart get a bite of bread, and him not be able to prevent it? Ha! Red Fox, if ever I hold you at a gun's end, the Lord have pity upon ye. Alan stopped to swallow down his anger. Well, David, what does he do? He declares all the farms to let, and, thinks he in his black heart, I'll soon get other tenants that are overbid these Stuarts, and Maccalls, and Maccrubs, for these are all names in my clan, David. And then, thinks he, Ardshiel will have to hold his bonnet on a French roadside. Well, said I, what followed? Alan laid down his pipe, which he had long since suffered to go out, and set his two hands upon his knees. "'Aye,' said he, "'you never guessed that, for these same Stuarts and Maccalls and Maccrubs, that had two rents to pay, one to King George by stark force, and one to Ardshiel by natural kindness, offered him a better price than any Campbell in all broad Scotland, and far he sent seeking them as far as to the sides of Clyde and the cross of Edinburgh, seeking and fleeching and begging them to come, where there was a Stuart to be starved and a red-headed hound of a Campbell to be pleasured. 
"'Well, Alan,' said I, "'that is a strange story, and a fine one, too. And wig as I may be, I am glad the man was beaten.' "'Him beaten?' echoed Alan. "'It's little ye ken of Campbell's, and less of the Red Fox. Him beaten? No, nor will be, till his blood's on the hillside. But if the day comes, David man, that I can find time and leisure for a bit of hunting, there grows not enough heather in all Scotland to hide him from my vengeance. Man, Alan, said I, you are neither very wise nor very Christian to blow off so many words of anger. They will do the man you call the fox no harm, and yourself no good. Tell me your tale plainly out. What did he next? "'And that's a good observe, David,' said Alan. "'Troth, and indeed, they will do him no harm, the more's the pity. And barring that about Christianity, of which my opinion is quite otherwise, or I would be no Christian, I am much of your mind.' "'Opinion here, or, or opinion there,' said I, "'it's a Kent thing that Christianity forbids revenge.' "'Aye,' said he, it's well seen it was a Campbell taught ye. It would be a convenient world for them and their sort, if there were no such thing as a lad and a gun behind a heather bush. But that's nothing to the point. This is what he did. Ay, said I, come to that. Well, David, said he, since he couldna be rid of the loyal commons by fair means, he swore he would be rid of them by foul. Ardshiel was to starve, that was the thing he aimed at, and since them that fed him in his exile would not be brought out, right or wrong, he would drive them out. Therefore he sent for lawyers and papers and redcoats to stand at his back, and the kindly folk of that country must all pack and tramp every father's son out of his father's house, and out of the place where he was bred and fed and played when he was a callant. And who are to succeed them? Bare-legged beggars! King George is to whistle for his rents. He maun do with less. He can spread his butter thinner. What cares Red Colin? If he can hurt Ardshiel, he has his wish. If he can pluck the meat from my chieftain's table, and the bit toys out of his children's hands, he will gang home singing to Glenure. Let me have a word, said I. Be sure, if they take less rents, be sure government has a finger in the pie. It's not this Campbell's fault, man. It's his orders. And if you killed this Colin to-morrow, what better would you be? There would be another factor in his shoes, as fast as Spur can drive. You're a good lad at a fight, said Alan. But, man, you have Whig blood in you. He spoke kindly enough, but there was so much anger under his contempt that I thought it was wise to change the conversation. I expressed my wonder how, with the highlands covered with troops, and guarded like a city in a siege, a man in his situation could come and go without arrest. "'It's easier than you would think,' said Alan. "'A bare hillside, you see, is like all one road.' If there's a sentry at one place, you'd just go by another. And then the heather's a great help. And everywhere there are friends' houses and friends' byres and haystacks. And besides, when folk talk of a country covered with troops, it's but a kind of a byword at the best. A soldier covers no more of it than his boot soles. I have fished the water with a sentry on the other side of the brae, and killed a fine trout and I have sat in the heather bush within six feet of another, and learned a real bonny tune from his whistling. This was it, said he, and whistled me the air. And then besides, he continued, it's no so bad now as it was in forty-six. The highlands are what they call pacified. Small wonder with never a gun or a sword left from Cantire to Cape Wrath, but what tenty folk have hidden in the thatch. But what I would like to ken, David, is just how long. Not long, you would think, 
with men like Hardshield in exile, and men like the Red Fox sitting burling the wine and oppressing the poor at home. But it's a kittle thing to decide what folks will bear, and what they will not. And why would Red Colin be riding his horse all over my poor country of Appen, and never a pretty lad to put a bullet in him? And with this Alan fell into a muse, and for a long time sat very sad and silent. I will add the rest of what I have to say about my friend, that he was skilled in all kinds of music, but principally pipe music, was a well-considered poet in his own tongue, had read several books both in French and English, was a dead shot, a good angler, and an excellent fencer with the small sword, as well as with his own particular weapon. For his faults they were on his face, and I now knew them all. But the worst of them, his childish propensity to take offence and to pick quarrels, he greatly laid aside in my case, out of regard for the battle of the roundhouse. But whether it was because I had done well myself, or because I had been a witness of his own much greater prowess, is more than I can tell. For though he had a great taste for courage in other men, yet he admired it most in Alan Breck. End of chapter.